So, David, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here today. The uh, You've heard uh, this morning uh, a lot of good information about uh, what sort of supports uh, are there on the medical side uh, for the pain. What I'd like to be able to tell you, is the good news is uh, there, the law is there to support you too. Because, I mean, if it was just the medical, if it was just the pain, that's one thing. But, of course, um, it impacts your lives in various ways, including the workplace. And sometimes getting the employers to understand that can be difficult. So today what we're going to, I'm going to walk you through the 25 minutes we have. I'm going to walk you through uh, basically uh, what are the rights of the employee who has a medical condition that impacts their work. And the spoiler alert is uh, you've got a right to be accommodated in the workplace. I'm going to then walk you through a bit of what your uh, rights are in that regard. I'm going to walk you through um, your responsibilities in seeking accommodation in the workplace. Then I'm going to walk through the employer's rights and responsibilities in the accommodation process. Finally, I'll share with you a couple of cases uh, where the accommodation process didn't go quite so well and it had to go to an adjudication of some kind. We'll have some time for questions at the end, which is great. I do have to, to uh, caution you that since I'm a lawyer, I can't give you specific advice on your employment situation without having done a conflict search yet because sometimes we act on the other side, on the other side, and that would be awkward. <laughs> and unprofessional. Okay, so employees with disabilities or medical condition have a right to reasonable accommodation in the workplace. Now, what is? Let's break that down a little bit. So, what's a medical condition? What's a disability? It's broadly interpreted. Broadly interpreted. So, it will include anything of a medical nature. It will also include anything of a of a uh, of psychological nature. So. Uh, it will include pain, it will include uh, depression, and the effects and the impacts of that. Those things uh, are entitled to, by law, accommodation in the workplace. And that means the employer has to consider what limitations does this medical condition, does this disability, what limitations does that uh, cause for the employee in the workplace, and the employer working with the employee has to try to find a way to change the workplace, change things so that uh, there's not a barrier for that employee. An accommodation could be any number of things. It could be modifying, the. it could be granting leave of absence to recover from an injury or an illness. It could be allowing a gradual return to work if you have been off. It could be altering the workplace. It could be altering your duties, but that, it could also be altering the, phys the physicality around you providing some sort of assistance. Uh, it might be approving a transfer to another job, if that makes sense. It could be rearranging of shifts. It could be bundling a meaningful job duties that currently aren't yours, but make sense in light of your condition. So the, the case law really suggests that you have to be creative when you're faced with uh, accommodation that isn't uh, necessary, easy to achieve in the workplace. So those are just examples of what you might have to do. There are limits too. Uh, the case law suggests that you can't expect the employer to create a job out of thin air, particularly one that they wouldn't have otherwise needed those duties for. That's sort of uh, the limit of it, but that's really unusual. There's usually a way for an employee to be accommodated in the workplace. Employees also have rights to existing workplace disability uh, benefits and policies. So when you're looking at this, um, these are things that may, may be in an individual setting, things you'll have to consider, but you also may have uh, short-term, long-term disability policies in the workplace. There may be other uh, assists or supports that uh, the employer has already put in place for generally. And those are the kind of things you're gonna to wanna to talk to HR about, and see what's there. If the employer does not accommodate an employee with a medical condition, then the employer will be operating a workplace that discriminates against individuals with disabilities. And that's a protected ground under the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code. Bad news for the employer if they do that. And that can result in a complaint under the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code if you're covered by Saskatchewan jurisdiction. If you work for a 
federally regulated company like a bank or something, it's the Canada Human Rights Act that you have a complaint under. So what are some of the employees' responsibilities? Those are, in a general sense, what the employees' rights are. What are some of the responsibilities? So first of all, how does the employee trigger the duty to accommodate? Well, there's three big things you need to do. One is you gotta tell your employer that you need accommodation. Uh, that's a very important thing. A lot of employees, it's hard for a lot of employees to do, understandably, but you have to ask for it if you're going to get it. Asking for it after the fact, if something bad or, or there's some trouble in the workplace, you still might be okay in the long run, but it's always best to ask when you need it and not wait. Another thing you're gonna to have to do is you'll have to give some form of doctor's note, sorry, some form of doctor's note or medical information. I know doctors love filling out those notes and forms, but you've gotta give some form. You don't need to give the diagnosis. Um, in fact, you don't. You shouldn't give the diagnosis if you're not comfortable. Uh, unless, unless in rare situations, that's the only way that the actual accommodation can be figured out. But you don't have to give the diagnosis. You don't even have to go into the nature of the condition, right? You just need to make sure that the employer has enough information to be able to know these are my medical limitations. So that's important. And lastly, and I'll go into a little more detail when I'm talking about the employer's responsibilities as to form and the like, but lastly, you've got to work with the employer to find the right accommodation. The duty to accommodate is sometimes viewed as a cooperative exercise in the sense that the employer's just not going to take whatever medical information you get, think up the uh, you know, the right accommodation and hand it to you in those situations, wouldn't it be good for you either? It's best if you work with them to determine what works. Sometimes that means uh, taking duties, assignments, reductions that you're not entirely comfortable with. And you, you will of course want to be careful in agreeing to do anything that you're not comfortable with, but sometimes there are cases where the reasonable accommodation is one that involves something you're not entirely happy with. And it's, uh, hopefully there's a way to find a way to improve that situation, but the case law is pretty clear that the employer does not have to come up with an accommodation that uh, simply makes the employee happy. The employer is entitled to come up with an accommodation, reduced hours, reduced uh, uh, duties, or anything like that, that uh, is reasonable for the whole workplace. In some situations, depending upon uh, the kind of uh, situation you're in, the kind of workplace duties you're in, uh, it may be useful for the employer and the employee to engage in a functional assessment of the workplace, just to see what can be done to try to make the work, workplace more friendly. So, employer rights. The fundamental employer rights are really um, to satisfy themselves that there's a condition there that, that requires them to accommodate. So that's where the doctor's note comes in. The doctor's note also comes in on the other employer's fundamental right, and that's to know the abilities and limitations of the employee. Um, the employer's really only entitled to know the obstacles to employment and to the duties, not again the diagnosis. And so medical information there for, uh, provided to the employer is sparse, but it's also, very private um, and it needs to be kept in a separate file. In some situations where the employee has been off work for a while, the employer also is entitled in most of those situations to uh, have some kind of confirmation medical wise that the employee is ready to return when they ask to return. And that comes with the employer's uh, responsibility to make sure the workplace is safe. So a certificate from the doctor may be necessary at a return stage as well. And that certificate might identify uh, any um, further accommodations or changes to the workplace that would be needed in order to allow a return to work, whether it's gradual or whether it's immediate. One of the things to, to keep in mind too with accommodation, and it's hard on employees again because they're already dealing with um, the disability, with pain or the like, but, and then they're asked by their employer to take a pay cut. If you're, the only accommodation for you involves a job that involves less duties or moving to a job that involves less pay, that's not always going to be the, the accommodation. It might rarely be the accommodation. But some, in some cases, that is the accommodation. The employer doesn't have to pay more than what the job calls for. So 
unless you have a disability policy, short-term, long-term disability policy that compensates for that. So keep in mind, sometimes the employer, um, if it puts you in another job that has a low, usually that always has a lower pay, you might have to accept that as part of the accommodation. The other thing that the employer has a right to do when the employee is off is request information about the likelihood prospects of return. So if you're in a situation where you're off and, they, and you receive a letter from your employer asking, is there, can you provide some confirmation prospects of your return? Again, it's not pleasant to receive that particular area where you're struggling, but the case law again suggests that you have to respond to that because if the employer has no uh, prospects of return, no idea of when you're coming back, then the cases suggest that the employer can move on with the employment relationship and not necessarily leave the space open forever or for an indeterminate amount of time. So these are the employer's uh, main rights. Let's talk a little bit more for a second about the privacy and invasiveness of the accommodation process because it's there for, for you, but it can feel very invasive. And I do want to emphasize and underline that uh, some level of medical information needs to be provided, but it sh they shouldn't be demanding any sort of detailed medical information from you, from your doctor, except in rare situations very rare situations where accommodations have been attempted and have failed because there was not enough data. So you should only be asked for the limitations and abilities, information maybe about uh, your prospects for returning to full duties, things like that, but you shouldn't be asked to provide too much. If you feel like you're being asked to provide too much, you may want to start questioning the process a little bit and raising that either with HR or your manager and ultimately uh, the Human Rights Commission, uh, in addition to accepting complaints, will also give you some advice. Likely. So that's a number you can call in addition to your lawyer too, of course, that uh, for advice on whether or not you're being asked to do too much. With doctors and forms, again, they don't like to provide them uh, very much, and you can understand why. The College of Physicians and Surgeons does have a guideline, I think it is, on uh, doctor's certificates, and we'll have to try and help them out because it's not a fun process. And generally speaking, what that document indicates is um, where you're having an extensive injury or illness, something that's prolonged, um, this sort of goes through five stages. First, at the time the, the patient attends the physician, there's the initial form that's returned to the employer that just talks about the nature of the condition and functions. Um, then you discuss, uh, if needed, uh, with the employer modified work options. Uh, the employer then sends a uh, this is if it all works perfectly. The employer then would send the modified work plan to the employee to review with their physician. And then the physician has the opportunity, because the physician only has the information about the workplace that you provide, right? So it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't work out well if, they, if there's not good data there. The physician can look at that modified work plan with you and say, you're gonna wanna worry about this, you're gonna wanna worry about that, or this looks good. Um, the physicians uh, can certify then at, at some stage that yes, medically, this uh, modified work plan doesn't cause any concerns. And then following a the review, uh, there may be needed some more follow-up. So that in the case of, a, a, of an extensive uh, illness, or one that's prolonged, that's sort of a process that, that, that the College of Physicians and Surgeons um, indicates is a good process and it's one that works well. For uh, you know days off here and there, or a doctor's note is probably all that's needed. But if there's going to be extensive accommodations, that's, that's an approach that works in most cases. Employer's resp responsibilities. Well, the employer's responsibility fundamentally is to accommodate the employee <coughs> to the point of undue hardship. Now we talked about what those accommodations can look like various and you certainly didn't list what they all could be and sometimes you do need to be creative because the courts have set a very high threshold and you'll want to keep this in mind as an employee um, who needs accommodation a very high threshold before the an employer can say I've uh, accommodated to the un, uh, to the point of undue hardship I can't do any more so what does undue hardship mean? It's one of these legal terms that we throw out there that everybody's supposed to know what it means, but there's no real definition. There's just a bunch of factors that uh, an adjudicator or a court would look at. One of them would be uh, uh, unbearable financial cost. 
Is it just too costly for the employer? Is there too much disruption to the workplace? Uh, is there interference with other employees? And they'll also consider the size of the operation. A large employer like the, you know, the uh, health region or the University of Saskatchewan has greater resources to be able to come up with accommodations than a very small employer. Those are all things that need to be taken into account when considering a departure. Unions. If you're in a union, you're not paying dues for nothing. You should be expecting something back from them, and one of the things you should be expecting is that they'll help with the accommodation process. So yeah, this means that uh, they have to apply due diligence and looking for ways to uh, work with the employer, sometimes pressure the employer, sometimes grieve. In a union situation, you don't even usually go to the Human Rights Commission first. You, your union grieves on your behalf. And if they don't, they can be in trouble. Because a union can be uh, have a human rights complaint against them nowadays just as much as the employer can if they don't represent you appropriately in uh, an accommodation case. So keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that uh, your collective agreement will have provisions that speak to the accommodation process, such as leaves, uh, doctor's notes, things like that, that's usually in there. Also there will be, uh, sometimes uh, an accommodation requires you to go into a position that would otherwise go to someone more senior. Well the case law is very clear that seniority gives way in accommodation. Somebody who needs an accommodation uh, does not, is not going to be barred from that position uh, because there's someone more senior for the job. You can't bump a person out of a job, but if the job is vacant and it's between you and a more senior person, if it's, that's a reasonable accommodation for you, you get it. So, talking too long, we're running out of time here, but I'll just walk you through an example of an uh, accommodation case. So if things go bad and a complaint is filed, it will go to an adjudicator, grievance arbitrator, Saskatchewan Human Rights uh, Inquiry, or in the case of Canada, an inquiry under that. In this situation, it's a federal case, a border services officer condition was endometriosis, very painful. You can see the accommodation there, uh, no need to wear a heavy belt, gear that would aggravate the pelvic pain. But the interesting thing about the case was that um, the employee failed an exam and wanted a con and said, I should have been accommodated so I don't have to, uh, that, that exam won't uh, prejudice me. The difficulty the employee ran into in that situation is that they didn't ask, they didn't identify that they needed accommodations on that exam, and it wasn't obvious to them. So remember how I said it's important you ask ahead of time? So that was one issue. The other was the employee didn't provide sufficient information to show that in terms of the exam, uh, the endometriosis caused any sort of prejudice to the ability to write the exam. So in that situation, the employee uh, needed to provide that link between the two. So it's very important that you're active participate in the accommodation process, that you identify when you need it and that you provide the medical as needed to show that connection between the problems you're having in the workplace and also the, uh, you know, the need for accommodation. I have one more example, but uh, I think we're out of time. I did want to leave a minute or two for questions. Do we have that? If you, want to, if you have one more slide, we're, we're okay. All right, well, I'll do this one last slide, then Molly May Cleaner. Uh, it's alleged condition was endometriosis because it was never actually made clear that the, that, that the employee was suffering from that, but the employer thought she was. And the employer fired her within three days of uh, figuring this out. Um, the employer, court, of course, told the human rights body in that situation, oh, it was subpar performance, probation, would have fired, uh, that's why we fired the person. And there was no evidence, uh, you can't crack open the employer's head, look in there to make sure that's the reason, right? Even if you want to. But the, uh, the, the commission in that situation, the tribunal, uh, drew an inference. You're hired in three, you're only there for three days, the employer finds out or thinks that there's a condition and then fires you. We're, we're going to draw an inference. And so that that employer was found guilty of discrimination and it cost him three thousand dollars. So it's important to note that it's difficult for employees to try to prove that they're being discriminated, but the system is intended to give you uh, a benefit of the doubt as well and put the onus on the employer sometimes.
process and there's rights that are being withheld and there's there's a legal process behind it. I find the most vulnerable patients are the ones that are the lower skilled. Uh, that my Molly made example is that an excellent one because the patients that I see that lose their jobs are the waitresses and the nannies that probably because the nanny is the only one that has to show up at work that day and because the pain is so intermittent, uh, they can't predict when their period is going to come, when the pain is going to flare up or you know they have the days where they can't work at all and so they call in sick and call in sick and call in sick and eventually get fired. And so for that group of patients, what kind of process is there? I mean I understand the employer and especially the nanny, having had a nanny myself, if my nanny kept calling in sick when I was off to surgery, I would have a hard time dealing with that. So what is the rights of both sides in that situation? How do you mitigate uh, that situation? It is usually the, the, the oftentimes the lower skill jobs that get uh, abused or manipulated. In the immigration context, you see that too. It's often the jobs that don't involve a lot of skill and they're the ones that uh, are being mistreated. And they also don't therefore have a lot of knowledge of how to explain. One of the things that you can do is, is uh, it's just education and let them know about the resources. So if uh, the, uh, in Saskatchewan, Calling the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission and talking to them uh, about uh, their rights. Their website provides a whole bunch of detail, including in the employee context, <coughs> that uh, could assist them as well. In, in, and as to the nanny situation, the difficulty you get into is um, you know, every situation is different. So in the Molly Maid situation, I, I suspect that employer could have, if, if there was a need for a surgery or something, could have uh, accommodated that. In the nanny situation, where it's a one-to-one -one relationship with the employer, it becomes a more difficult thing. So that doesn't mean you can just say, sorry, this isn't going to work out, but the factors in that situation are far different than the factors you would have where you're dealing with a, a whole pool of employees and your ability to adjust is a lot more easy. And so if you're in a union, you should uh, discuss this stuff with the union, not the human resources. Yeah, and some people in the, in the accommodation process, uh, that's one of the rare situations where a lot of employees will, will go directly to HR instead of their union. And I think it's because of the sensitivity of it, right? But uh, my recommendation is, if you, particularly if you've got a good union steward or a good relationship, is to start with them, to talk to them, to get their advice. They're there to be your advisors. They're there to, to, uh, to bargain on your behalf. They may send you to, uh, to the HR person to talk then, but it's good to, to let them know and to have them in the ground floor. Um, I was just talking about, so, okay, let's say you're in an interview for a job, and they ask, so is there anything that could, you know, in, impede you in workplace that you're not telling me about? Not that you're not telling me about, but that's what I'm like. Um, are you, as an employee, are you, I'm just asking, like, what are your legal rights in terms of, do you have to tell them? Like, for example, let's say you've endometriosis and to be out of commission and once a month or something for a couple days. Um, are you entitled to tell that employer during the hiring process? Generally speaking, the answer to that is no. Uh, you are, um, you if you feel like, if you've read the job description or the posting, you feel that uh, I can do this job with appropriate accommodations, and that's the answer. And when you get the job, they have to give you those accommodations. Mm -hmm. if, you, if they were to inquire into that and say, Mm, I don't think I want to even try to accommodate that scenario, then they're guilty of human rights complaint right there. Now, some employees feel are happy to volunteer that information, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's your comfort level with privacy and your own that, that uh, is guiding that, not the legal. They have no entitlement uh, to pry into what disabilities you may have at that stage. Yes. Um, I also work with oh, the... Sorry, I, I think we got Taskmaster when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so.